PSC National Briefing for 2nd of August 2021. The Secretary to the Government of the Federation and Chairman of the Presidential Steering Committee on COVID-19, Home Ministers here present, Permanent Secretary, Heads of Agencies here present. So today, we are happy to have with us the Deputy Chief of Mission of the Embassy of the United States of America, Kathleen Pittman. We want to welcome her to our briefing for today. We also have with us today Anne E. Patterson, is the Mission Director, you said, Nigeria. Still with us today, we have UNICEF representative in Nigeria, Peter J.F. Hawkins. So you must welcome. The last but not the least on this row, we have Mary Adetinuke Boyd, is the US CDC country director, Nigeria. You're welcome, ma'am, to the program for today. We also like to thank our live and remote reporters at various locations who are joining us on this live broadcast. We want to thank our viewer and listener at home who have joined us. Indeed, this program is coming to you live from the National Briefing Hall of the Office of the Secretary of the Government of the Federation, located here in Abuja, Nigeria. I want to thank you most sincerely for joining us. As usual, in our style of presentation, would please at this time respectfully invite the Secretary to the Government of the Federation and Chairman of the Presidential Steering Committee to the podium. Sayon. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen of the press, I welcome you to the Presidential Steering Committee on COVID-19 National Briefing for today, Monday, the, the 2nd of August, 2021, after a very, very long break. As a matter of fact, I was looking at the faces uh, this afternoon. Most of you don't look the same way I saw you some months ago. <laughs> During this uh, very long break, the Presidential Steering Committee uh, has been meeting to deliberate on the rising number of uh, COVID-19 cases and proper ways to contain and curtail the huge impact on our lives and livelihood. The world has added about 4 million cases and under 100,000 deaths in the last one week. All countries in the West African sub-region are beginning to see the third wave while Nigeria is recording about 500 cases daily in the last seven days. Our test positivity ratio has increased to about 6%. This is worrisome and shows that we are not out of the woods yet. It is now, uh, it is no, uh, no more news uh, that the Delta variant has made its way into Nigeria. Uh, the Presidential Steering Committee is particularly concerned about the situation in Lagos, Akwa Ibom, Oyo, Rivers, and Plateau states, along with the Federal Capital Territory. As this variant has made its way into these states and accounts for the rising cases in these states and across the nation. Lagos alone accounts for over 50% of the number of cases. The DG, Nigeria Center for Disease Control, will elaborate on this development. This development calls for great caution because the virus is very virulent, uh, raging in so many other countries of the world. We must therefore keep observing the non-pharmaceutical interventions and also ensure that we get vaccinated when the vaccines are made available very soon. 
Vaccination prevents severe cases and reduces hospital hospitalization and death, but does not eliminate contacting the virus. Hence, the need to religiously observe the non-pharmaceutical interventions. We need to test more and dictate early enough so that people who have contacted the virus can be isolated and manage early. I am pleased to announce that we currently have 143 molecular laboratories in the country. 54 are private owned and 89 are public. Where we can go and get tested. Please, I urge all Nigerians to make yourselves available for testing and please continue to test regularly. The Presidential Steering Committee is ready to publish over 500 travelers who violated the travel protocol and those who evaded quarantine even this week. Similarly, those who had their passports bad for six months because of disregard for either quarantine or travel protocols, now at the end of the expiration of the six months, the Controller General of Immigration Services will be lifting the restriction on their travel documents in the next coming days. The CG immigration has also been directed to lift all suspensions and to activate the new sanctions that we are going to put in place on these over 500 travelers who have breached one form of protocol or the other. Travelers who did not go for their day seven test will have restriction placed on their international passports for the next six months, while those who evaded quarantine will similarly have restrictions on their international po passports for the next one year. These are very, very dear measures that we are putting in place because we have a responsibility as a government to protect the lives of our countrymen and women. It's a very difficult decision, but we need to balance lives and livelihood. I also want to announce that the National International Travel Protocol is being reviewed to better enhance a hitch-free experience for travelers. This review will be completed in the next two weeks. Consequently, after that migration and the completion of this process, we believe that travelers will have a seamless process to activate payments on the travel portal and to also upload uh, their test reports on the NCDC portal. As a follow-up, the Akanu EBM International Airport Inugu is ready for reopening. A date will be announced in due course after a few logistic issues are cleared. The Presidential Steering Committee has also reviewed the travel protocols for diplomatic travelers, and the Honorable Minister of Foreign Affairs will brief uh, this uh, uh, media on the steps that have been taken so that as much as possible we have a seamless process when it comes to protocols uh, uh, that are required for diplomatic travelers. Today we are privileged to have the dep deputy head of mission and other members of the American Embassy who are graciously donating over 4 billion doses of Moderna vaccines to Nigeria. We thank the government and the people of the United States for this gift, 
and we promise that it will be utilized judiciously. Also important to note is that every state of this country now has at least one U701 ultra-call chain equipment to store ultra-call vaccines. So we are ready to take delivery of this gift and we have adequately provided call chain storage facility in the 36 states and the Federal Capital Territory to host and house these vaccines. Before I call on the Honorable Minister of Health, followed by the DG, Nigerian Center for Disease Control, and the ED, National Primary Healthcare Development Agency, and the technical head of the Secretariat, to give us uh, their technical updates for today. I want to use this opportunity to cede uh, the floor to the Deputy Head of Mission, who is leading the delegation from the United States uh, Embassy uh, to make their presentation. And thereafter, we will continue with the technical segment of this media briefing. Thank you. And we thank you so much for the generosity of the government and the people of the United States to the people and government of Nigeria. And as I said in my address, we want to assure you that it would, these vaccines will be judiciously used and timely so that the efficacy and the need to vaccinate our people is done in a very rapid way uh, so that we can get uh, the population uh, prepared uh, to be able to uh, uh, push the numbers. Uh, so far we have just vaccinated about 2% of our population. And to get to herd immunity, we need to get to 60 to 70%. So we have got a long way. But this generous donation that is coming from the government and people of the United States will go a long way, along with other sources of vaccines that we are procuring and also receiving. You have details of the uh, vaccines that we are expecting in the months of August and September from the Executive Director of the Primary Healthcare Development Agency at the appropriate moment. Thank you, and wish you a very pleasant evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, the Secretary to the Government of the Federation and Chairman of the PIC. It affords us an opportunity now to invite the Deputy Chief of Mission, Embassy of the United States of America, Kathleen Pittsburn, to the platform. <laughs> you can put it down. <laughs> you can put the microphone I'll help, I'll help you with that. You know, yeah. we, we are not, we are no, not. Can, see you. Is there, can I see me? Okay. Yeah, All right. Thank you and good evening. Um, I actually uh, watch these uh, press briefings actually pretty religiously. So I'm very excited to actually be on the other sides of the microphones. Um, so thank you, uh, Honorable SGF, for, for the invitation. And I'm here with many friends, the ministers. Okay, thanks. The ministers, <laughs> the ministers of health and uh, foreign affairs, uh, ministers of state who I've worked with for 20 years. Dr. Faisal, this administration has increased the numbers uh, or the amount of money committed to bringing vaccines throughout Africa and the rest of the world. So many of you may or may not know is that this is part of our two billion dollar commitment to bring um, vaccines. We helped pay um, into COVAX for the AstraZeneca that arrived um, in March 2nd. And there is other shipments of Pfizer and J&J &J, uh, that will be coming through that we have also with our other um, donor partners to fund. So we feel this is very important because ending the pandemic is something everybody in the world has to participate in together. And if we don't do it together and we don't ensure that everybody reaches herd immunity, we're gonna be wearing these face masks and practicing non-pharmaceutical interventions for a long time. So we would like to get out of that business if we can. Um, so through um, our, our particular uh, agencies at POST, I know that we are able to uh, make sure that the vaccines get rolled out properly. We've worked with, with you on ending polio here. Um, we have a great 
supply chain and great work that we're doing on HIV AIDS. So I, I think that this is going to be um, just yet another thing that we're doing um, in partnership. So I just want to leave you with a few words from President Biden, who said that the United States is committing, committed to bring the same urgency to the international vaccination efforts that we've demonstrated at home. And if many of you have seen in the United States, we have some states with very, very high vaccination rates. And, and that's what we'd like to see here in Nigeria is to work closely with you to get the same type of uh, vaccination rates here. Um, that's gonna depend on all of us to really overcome vaccine hesitancy. And so I really urge anybody who has not been vaccinated to get a vaccination. Um, it's, one of the, it's the one thing that you can do to protect yourself and your family, protect your community and protect other Nigerians. Um, and if we don't all do this, we're never going to see the end of this pandemic. So I'm going to leave you with that um, challenge. Um, and I want to really thank um, the secretary and others for allowing us to be here to share um, the good news with you. So 4,080,000 doses of Moderna. Um, so get ready and get jabbed. So I'll leave you there. Thank you very much. All the ministers here present, our guests from the U.S. Mission and UNICEF, Directors General and Executive Director, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the press. Like many parts of Africa, Nigeria has begun to record a sharp increase in the number of confirmed COVID-19 cases, especially since this month of July, as global anxiety over the Delta variant spreads. All data indicate that we are now no doubt in the third wave, the resurgence of SARS-CoV-2 infection, which we saw coming when it first, since it first appeared in India. As of today, Nigeria has recorded about 174,315 COVID-19 cases from out of 2,542,261 samples tested, with 7,151 cases active, and sadly, 2,149 fatalities. I wish to use this opportunity right away to again solicit more participation of our states in the roles that they have to play at this very trying time in sample collection, preparing isolation and treatment centers, providing logistics for movement of commodities, supporting vaccinations, especially by providing resources for those who are conducting vaccination, and finally reporting to the various COVID-19 pillars. Only 17 states made data or sample submissions in the last cycle, and there were Lagos and Akwai bomb states were turning out to be the epicenters. But there are others, we have about eight states of concern right now, I shall come to that a little bit later. Of particular concern is that the Delta variant spreads more rapidly, 60% more rapidly, and has become predominant in many countries, being presently responsible for over 90% of COVID variants, uh, infections in the United States. It is also less discriminatory in the people it affects with severe illness. 
whereas the previous variants we saw mostly affected those who above a certain age of 60 and also who had pre-existing illnesses. The Delta variant is known to be less discriminatory. It affects people, that affected young people and even children. I therefore wish to renew my call to all Nigerians to improve on observance of public health measures and non-pharmaceutical interventions because they are the best, the simplest, the cheapest, and the most reliable uh, means of protection we have to date if we are to continue to prevent the widespread of these variants. I want to add to that that all those who live in the states that have been mentioned as uh, those of concern should voluntarily reduce their travel, should stay more at home, because the more we move around, the more the risk of transmission and carrying this virus to places where it did not exist. So unless you have a really strong reason, I'm advising that all people stay in their homes or stay in their state until we can see better. These states are Lagos, Oyo, Rivers, FCT, Kaduna, Kano, Akwaibom, and Plateau. We're asking for cooperation not to travel for leisure at this time, except it is absolutely necessary. We are also considering strategies to scale up testing and to identify cases for isolation and treatment. And I want to ask that if you feel unwell, especially if you have a fever or you suspect you might not be well, visit the nearest testing center, visit a hospital, and get a COVID test. Less than 10% of beds in our treatment centers are occupied. So we still have a lot of oxygen supply, it's assured. And as we continue to build up our oxygen capacity in our country today, we are going to be having well over 60, 70 oxygen plants in the country. And we are going to make sure that they are widespread out places like Wari, Contagora, and places that are not necessarily in state capital, we have an oxygen generating plant in the State General Hospital. And I want to urge, urge governors of these states to begin to prepare the state-owned general hospitals to have oxygen plants. In addition, we shall have 12 liquid oxygen tanks that will be distributed as reserve for major teaching hospitals where we shall have, back, where we need a backup of that type. To strengthen hope-based care among those who are COVID-19 positive but have only mild or no symptoms, we have developed a training manual for home-based isolation and care, which includes mental health and psychosocial support. This manual can also be useful for those who are in quarantine. The Federal Ministry of Health is engaging resident doctors who have embarked on an industrial action from this morning with a view to quickly resolving the issues. And while this is going on, all medical directors at federal and also state hospitals are hereby directed to ensure that service delivery is not disrupted in their hospitals. The vaccination in Nigeria should resume very soon. As we all know, we had to end it on the 9th of July when we ran out of vaccines. But thankfully, with the arrival last night or this morning of 4 million and 80,000 doses of Moderna vaccines, uh, thanks to the, uh, our friends in the United States of America. The vaccines are undergoing necessary validation by NAFDAQ. Nigeria would have received 40 million doses by the end of the year, and the National Primary Health Development Agency is up to the task of applying all of these and shall commence the distribution to states as soon as the certification 
for use is prepared. I wish to implore all eligible, eligible citizens to present themselves for vaccination as the best way to preserve your life, your health, and your livelihood. Evidence from our treatment centers show that most of those with severe illnesses or the deaths from COVID-19 are those who did not get vaccinated. This is the same evidence as a matter of fact in other countries. It's also been observed that where infection occurred uh, among those who were vaccinated, it came with very mild or no sign of illness. It is therefore in our interest to be vaccinated. It's also a moral responsibility because it protects not only you, but should be protecting your loved ones and your colleagues and all those you live with. We hope that by the time we have achieved our target of 70% or more vaccine coverage, we should all be able to breathe easier from the threat of COVID-19. Thank you for your attention. Uh, after holding down the number of infections in our country for about three months, we've begun to see an increase in the number of cases. Uh, many people ask, why is that the case? I, I think why the question that I'm surprised about, why that hasn't even happened earlier, given how relaxed we've become in terms of our response. But the fact is that we're now in the third wave of uh, this outbreak in Nigeria. Having said that, uh, cases are predominantly in a few states, but as we know, we are an interconnected country. People will travel, and it's very likely that very soon we'll see increases in other states. Uh, the data shows that right now in Lagos, one in 10 people that we test turn out to be positive a test positivity ratio of about 10%, same in our quiet bomb state. The national average is 6%, but it varies really from about 1% in many states to about uh, 8, 10% in a few uh, states. Given our uh, relationships, travel, it's very likely that uh, with this virus, if we don't take specific measures, we'll see uh, even further increases in the number of cases. People also ask, is this because you're just testing more? No, actually, we are testing more incrementally, but I think the detection of the increase in cases in Akwaibom, uh, in Oyo, in Rivers, actually is a demonstration that our surveillance system is working. Uh, the investments that we've made over the last two years in setting up a surveillance architecture for COVID has been able to identify these increases in the few states where this is currently happening. In addition to just detection of cases, we've also built up our genomic sequencing capabilities, which has led, unfortunately, to the situation in our bomb state, where right now 80% of all the recently that confirmed cases have been confirmed to be the Delta variant, which means that transmission is likely to be a lot more intense, and we have to redouble all the efforts that we've been making to contain the spread of this virus. So it's even more gratifying that in addition to the tools that we had already, we now have four million new doses of vaccines to work with. As viruses evolve, it is in their nature to mutate. And as transmission continues, it is likely that new mutants will continue to emerge unless we are able to contain transmission. To understand what is going on, how they're mutating, where they're going, who is getting infected, that is why we have surveillance systems. And surveillance systems start from those that collect samples to the labs that test to the higher level labs that do the sequencing, to the colleagues that do the analysis and presentation. And with that knowledge, uh, we lead, uh, provide our policymakers the information they need 
to make very hard decisions. And I'm sure those, that data will feed into the data our colleagues at MPACDA will now use to define uh, how the vaccine allocation wo will work across the country, taking into consideration where the burden of disease is at the moment. But the reality with the Delta variant is that it is much more transmissible. Um, but the good thing, too, is that the vaccines have been shown to provide protection against severe disease, hospitalizations, and deaths caused by the COVID-19, including the Delta variant. So the vaccination that we'll get uh, will really help us mitigate the impact of this virus. So really my appeal to all Nigerians is in addition to everything we've been saying to limit exposure, limit involvement in mass gathering events, parties, weddings, um, going out at night to clubs, wherever the gatherings indoors, especially with a lot of people, that exposes you to increased risk. And with this new Delta variant, it doesn't take a lot for you to get infected. Many other countries have learned the hard way, so we have to really push hard to not experience, not go through those experiences ourselves in Nigeria and mitigate the impact of this new variant in our country. So as the ED of MPACD will elaborate on in a few minutes, uh, the plans to uh, distribute the vaccines in Nigeria. The vaccines themselves will not solve all our problems. We don't have enough uh, to go around. So if you do have access, please go. If you don't, please continue doing what we need to do. Uh, if you're not yet of the age that is being recommended for vaccines, please manage the uh, risk to yourselves and your families as much as we possibly can. A lot of activities in young people uh, who don't necessarily get ill, but of course transmit the virus to others. So when we say please mitigate the impact, we're not only referring to the uh, population that have been typically most affected by COVID-19 so far. We continue to support all the states in the response. The team has just been deployed to Aquaibom to support our colleagues working very hard. Uh, the colleagues in Aquaibom State uh, really deserve a lot of credit for the work they've done over the last uh, few months, especially the last few weeks, detecting clusters. These cases are really spread across the state, so they're not located in one place alone. But really credit to the excellent team uh, working at Kwai Bomb State, responding to the outbreak uh, at the moment. Uh, to divert a little bit, um, colleagues would have seen that in addition uh, to COVID, we've been challenged by a large a cholera outbreak in many states in the country. Uh, we continue to work in response. Together again with our colleagues in MPACDA, we're about to start a vaccination campaign in Bauchi uh, State where we had one of the most severe outbreaks. But vaccination will not solve the cholera problem. Cholera is a disease of water, sanitation, and hygiene. And as long as we don't address those fundamental issues, we will not get ahead of uh, cholera. So we're going to work very intensively with states to really rethink the ecosystem that leads to people developing cholera in Nigeria and try as much as possible to demedicalize the assumption that uh, response by vaccines or oral rehydration fluids will solve the problem. We need to go back to the very basics to address the challenges that cholera um, continues to place on us in Nigeria almost every year. Uh, finally, uh, a few words of hope. We've been responding to this outbreak now for more, close to two years. And as much as I have announced in the beginning that we're at the beginning of a third wave, we know a lot more than we did 18 months ago. We know a lot more on the response side, but we also know a lot more as citizens. So our responsibility now is to use our collective knowledge to respond to the challenges that we are facing. And really, for each of us to deliver on what we now know that works, take responsibility for the actions that we need to do, and make sure we actually deliver on the response at the federal, state, local levels, but also at the level of every leader, whether you're leading a church, an organization, or whatever group of people uh, come together. At NCDC last week, 
we called together uh, our colleagues to learn the lessons from the outbreak in our annual conference and with the support from the Africa CDC who was represented by the director, the director of the West Africa Health Organization, the chief scientist of the World, uh, World Health Organization's colleagues from USCDC, we deliberated on the response so far, the lessons that we have learned, and we committed ourselves to making sure that we learn from those lessons and continue working very hard to protect the health of all Nigerians. So to conclude, even though the third wave is on us, there are a few other things that are on us as well. We've seen political activities increase across the country. All of these lead to gatherings. The politics in itself is not the problem. The problem is the gatherings of people that then escalate uh, to further transmission of the virus. So please, as we engage in these activities or all the other activities that tend to happen as we get to the second half of the year. Uh, we can't wish away the fact that we're in the middle of this pandemic. We have to learn to live with this at the moment until we can get ahead of it. It means that there will be, still be a lot of sacrifices that are needed in our organizations, in our jobs, in our, wherever we gather. And we need to really uh, avoid a situation we have seen in many countries where the entire health system uh, collapsed from the force of infection. So we keep saying the same thing and we have to keep encouraging each other to do the very hard things that we need to do to mitigate the impact of this virus. But we've learned a lot over the last one and a half years. Now is the time to implement all those measures that we've learned and to make sure that we keep our country safe. Thank you. The Presidential Serian Committee and Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Honorable Ministers here present, uh, Deputy uh, Ambassador of the United States, Head of Mission, uh, colleagues, uh, country representatives, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, permit me to raise an already established protocol. Uh, permit me to start uh, by once again expressing our profound appreciation to all Nigerians and indeed friends of Nigeria for the support we received during the first phase of our strategic COVID-19 vaccination rollout, which officially ended a few weeks ago. As you are already aware, yesterday, we received 4 million and 80 doses of Moderna COVID-19 vaccine from the United States government donated through the COVAX facility. Before the arrival of these vaccines, the federal government had proactively procured 60 units of ultra cold chain equipment, out of which 37 have already been deployed to the 36 states and the federal capital territory. We have experimented and verified our ultra cold chain uh, facilities are capable of storing COVID-19 vaccines that require temperatures of below minus 40 degrees Celsius to minus 80 degrees Celsius. The vaccines will be deployed to the states as soon as we receive clearance from NAVDAQ. This is in line with standard practice. When the vaccines arrived in the early hours of Sunday, NAVDAQ officials were on ground and they randomly collected some of the samples for testing to certify if they are fit for use in Nigeria. Once we receive NAVDAQ clearance, we should be in a couple days, we will commence distribution to the states that are already on standby. Like the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, the Moderna vaccine requires two doses, which should be taken at four weeks interval. We strongly advise Nigerians who are eligible for vaccination to come out and get vaccinated and ensure that they follow the vaccination schedule in taking their second doses when they are due. The Moderna vaccine has been proven to be effective in preventing severe form of COVID-19 after the second dose. It is also, from some studies, 74 to 94 percent effective against the Delta variant of COVID-19 virus. While Moderna and AstraZeneca vaccine 
do the same job of preventing a severe COVID-19 and death. We advise that people should avoid taking the vaccines one after the other. In other words, those who have taken AstraZeneca as first dose should also take AstraZeneca as the second dose. And those who will take Moderna as the first dose should take Moderna as second dose when due. Uh, we are engaging with the World Health Organization and the SAGE to look at the new recommendations around AstraZeneca and Pfizer uh, vaccination. On this note, it is important to inform you that the next batch of AstraZeneca vaccines will be arriving within the next couple of weeks and will be dedicated to second dose administration. This is to ensure that those who have taken their first dose are provided with the same vaccine for their second doses. To improve utilization and minimize challenges in our electronic management of information data, the EMIT platform, we have developed a mobile app that can be downloaded by anyone from the Android or Apple store. The app contains verification auto site, which enables clients to verify their records within 24 hours and an effective troubleshooting platform. With this app, clients can register and receive SMS and email confirmation efficiently. We plan to launch this on Thursday uh, this week. We had previously informed you that we'll be adopting the whole of family approach to integrate COVID-19 vaccination with other basic primary healthcare services, such as childhood vaccination, screening for hypertension, and other non-communicable diseases. This will ensure that while protecting eligible Nigerians against COVID-19, we are also concerned about the total health of the individual and the entire family. This will further enhance the acceptability of COVID-19 vaccines because we're taking into consideration that it is not only COVID-19 that is a health challenge in Nigeria. So we're using the platform and the focus on COVID-19 to also address other health issues within the community. Like I mentioned in our earlier briefings, we have assurances of the delivery of 698,880 doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine within the next two weeks, and also 3,924,000 doses of the Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine uh, later this month. Uh, this will again go towards uh, vaccinating those who have not had their second doses and then give an opportunity for others to, to take their first and second doses. We recognize the fact that Nigeria could not have been successful in fully utilizing the 4 million doses of AstraZeneca vaccines we received from the COVAX facility in the first phase without the support of the media. As we continue to appreciate this, let us be mindful that the current phase of the vaccination the second phase would require increased delivery of responsibility and commitment from the media. We need to double our efforts in confronting misinformation, disinformation, and educating Nigerians on the need to get vaccinated against COVID-19. We are aware that some concerns may be raised around which of the vaccine brand is best and who is eligible to take which. Let me be clear that all the vaccines we receive in Nigeria are safe and effective in providing protection against COVID-19, inclusive of the Delta variant. No vaccine is superior to the other. They only have different manufacturers, but all of them will deliver protection against COVID-19 to anyone who is vaccinated, especially severe forms of COVID-19. Anyone who is 18 years and above and has not been vaccinated is eligible to take any of the vaccines in the recommended doses. On this note, I would like to call on all eligible persons in the country to register and go to the nearest designated health facility for vaccination against COVID-19. The government is committed to providing 
safe and effective COVID-19 vaccination and ensuring that all eligible persons in Nigeria are vaccinated. Let me remind us that the detection of the Delta variant of COVID-19 virus in Nigeria underscores the need to continue to observe non-pharmaceutical preventive measures such as wearing of face masks, social distancing, and hand hygiene to curb the transmission of the disease. We cannot overemphasize the use of these public health measures. In conclusion, I would like to thank the state and local governments, our partners, our donors, traditional and religious leaders, and all our dedicated frontline health workers who made it possible for us to fully utilize the vaccines in the first phase and all the preparations that have gone into rolling out the second phase of the vaccination. I thank you for listening. Inside the country, or they will be quarantined. We want to ask why is this so? And because that action alone seemed to cast as passion on the vaccines being taken in the country. And is Nigeria taking this up diplomatically? Or are we going to apply reciprocity to such countries like the United Kingdom? Thank you. Good afternoon, all. Rachel Abuja from the News Agency of Nigeria. My first question is for the director of CDC. But, uh, sometimes in June, um, the US CDC was investigating a, a potential real side effect COVID, from COVID-19 modella for, for inflammation of heart um, muscles called the uh, myo. Thank you. And also, there were reports for people that had um, derma fillers experiencing swollen on their faces, all from side effect of Modena vaccine. So the investigation, we're yet to get the results from that particular investigation. So will you be advising Nigerians to go ahead to vaccinate people from the age of 30 below? Thank you very much. My last question is for the DG and CDC. Uh, so we, we have seen ongoing transmission um, of the data variant in countries that have vaccinated large um, part of their population. Is the DG worried of the impact of new variants um, on the, effective, the effectiveness of um, the countries and vaccine? Again, DG, congratulations um, for an excellent work you and your team did um, for sequencing the acquired um, samples so quickly, it was quick. Have you found um, the Delta variant in Lagos? And why are we not sequencing more samples from Lagos to see? My last question is for the um, primary health care EES. Earlier today, even though you just corrected yourself, you said that um, the vaccine received samples were with NAVDAC. And you said um, NAVDAC were going to carry out evaluation um, sorry, if, um, effect. You said you made mention of NAVDAC was going to carry on. Um, you just said assessment here, but you said efficacy or potential, something. So now you just made mention of um, NAVDAC is going to take assessment. We would like to know what kind of assessment or efficacy it's been carried in the, in the, within, in the period of 48 hours. I'm not a scientist, but at least I, I know small. Then, um, or, or are they, <laughs> or is NAVDA going to carry a vacuum or vaccine vibe? So just explain to us what that means. And again, sir, um, the vaccine uptake is on. I don't know how you've been managing situation of electricity. In, um, local, in those remote areas. So you tell us what you'll be doing differently. Now for the SGF, sir. So people will say we are facing, this is a national thing. So it's meant to be a national response. 
But you find out that some states are taking their samples outside the country for sequencing. You just made mention that we have 140 something machines across Nigeria, but we are still going out of the country to do sequencing. I don't know if that is right. I really want to know your relationship with the, Fed, uh, with the state government in fighting this vaccine, since some states are doing well while other states are doing real badly. So help us to clarify this. Thank you very much. Good evening, sirs. My name is Hassan Umar Farouk. I report for Liberty Radio and Television. Uh, Dr. Faisal Shai, Nigerians that are enthusiasts, those that are willing to take vaccines, have already taken those uh, remaining are the one resistant vaccines. With this arrival of this batch of Moderna vaccines, what are you going to do new to convince Nigerians that this is the only way out of COVID-19? SGF, sir, with the arrival of this Delta variant, are you contemplating another lockdown? Thank you very much. Thank you for those questions from my colleagues. Let's now return to having one more technical report as we invite the Honorable Minister of Foreign Affairs. You have a floor. A very urgent call from um, a foreign uh, country. Um, so just to uh, brief you on the situation with regards to uh, uh, diplomats, and of course talking about diplomats, we'd like to extend our uh, profound gratitude to the U.S. government um, for this very generous uh, and, and, and very um, helpful uh, donation uh, to the country. So thank you very, very much indeed uh, for that. Um, now there are two categories. Um, we, we had some issues uh, with diplomats at uh, ports of entry, and it was really important uh, the um, Presidential uh, Standing uh, Committee uh, decided that, um, that we had to come up with something that was clear, that everybody could uh, understand, all the diplomats, and, um, and not have the uh, difficult situation that we were having. So um, basically, there are two categories of countries. Uh, as you know. Uh, they're the restricted countries, four countries that uh, under a restricted protocol and, um, and other countries. Now, um, regarding diplomats coming uh, from the restricted countries or that have visited or passed through those restricted countries uh, in the last uh, 14 days, there's a special uh, a protocol that we, uh, that we have uh, uh, in place. Now, um, so, of course, everybody has to do a, a, a PCR test, um, you know, before uh, traveling 72 hours uh, uh, before. But for non-restricted uh, countries, um, the diplomats uh, are coming from those countries um, just have to have that um, uh, 74, uh, 72 hours uh, prior uh, uh, PCR uh, uh, test, and then within seven days uh, do a test in any accredited uh, private uh, laboratory. If they have no PCR test taken, a valid PCR test, then they would have to be quarantined uh, in uh, uh, government uh, uh, facilities. But, um, but if they do have a PCR test, they still have to do uh, a seven-day self-isolation at their residence. And, um, you know, if um, they do uh, a, a test, um, um, uh, a positive uh, for diplomats, and it's a mild uh, a, a condition, they can uh, isolate uh, at home. And um, if it's um, uh, moderate uh, to severe, uh, then they have to uh, be uh, in a accredited hospital uh, facilities. Uh, now, for those diplomats coming from non-restricted countries, they can get special uh, waivers uh, from the seven-day uh, isolation. And um, this will be applicable or available uh, to high-profile diplomats. And um, so if, for instance, they're coming uh, to meet with uh, the president um, or the vice president, then they would be, um, they, they, they would qualify uh, for a seven-day uh, isolation. Then the others would now be decided on an ad hoc uh, basis 
uh, as to uh, whether they would benefit from that uh, uh, waiver. So that's in respect of um, diplomats coming from non-restricted uh, countries. Now, diplomats um, coming from, I mean, coming from, not coming from, or coming from non-restricted countries, sorry, yeah. Uh, then diplomats coming from those four, any of those four uh, restricted countries or have visited uh, any of those four uh, restricted countries within the last uh, 14 days, um, there's a possibility of a waiver for them um, to very essential uh, personnel uh, on, uh, on special recommendation, uh, uh, Ministry of uh, uh, Foreign Affairs. Um, but nevertheless, uh, with that waiver, they would still need to be screened at the airport um, you know, um, before entering uh, into uh, the, the country. Um, and those waivers can only be given by the Presidential uh, Steering Committee. Uh, sorry, I had said Standing Committee before. Uh, presidential Steering Committee um, can only issue the waivers that will be shown uh, at the uh, ports of uh, uh, entry. And um, now, this is a catch, and this is what has caused a, a little bit of um, some issues uh, uh, um, in the past. Now, all diplomats coming from any of those four countries within the last 14 days um, have to, uh, we're afraid, um, quarantine in approved government uh, facilities. And um, the only exemption or waiver from this would be for uh, the ambassador uh, of a particular country and his or her spouse and uh, the deputy uh, ambassador, um, but alone. So only those three categories of, uh, of diplomats can get an exemption um, uh, not to isolate. They'll still have to isolate uh, in their private residence or whatever, but not have to isolate in government approved uh, uh, facilities. And, uh, and in those cases, they have to do tests on the second day uh, after arrival and also uh, seven days on the seventh day after uh, arrival. But um, we did a briefing for all the diplomats and went through in greater detail um, you know, uh, to make it absolutely uh, clear. And we've just finalized the, uh, the text, the regulations, and we will be making that, uh, circulating that to all the missions and also to our missions uh, around the world uh, to share with their host governments. So that's the uh, situation. Thank you very much. Oh, Baloya of the Sun newspapers. Uh, two quick uh, clarification. One, um, which of the states has the highest case of Delta variant? The SGF said Lagos has 50, and uh, NCDC is saying, yes, 50%, and then they, the NCDC is saying 80%. So we need that, we need that clarification. Secondly, um, I heard the NCDC uh, DG said that we are now officially experiencing third wave, uh, third wave of COVID-19. Is that what it is, please? I need to um, be clear. Thank you. Thank you for those questions. Uh, we will now invite responses uh, from our Minister of Health. Let's start from you. Ali to the questions. Uh, that is that Lagos has more than half of all these cases. And uh, the specific number, well, that is a matter of uh, detail. And uh, as far as the, uh, the question of uh, whether we're officially in the, in, in the, in the third wave, uh, it is, uh, it's not something that starts at once. It's, it starts gradually. It is insidious. So we're beginning to see an increase in the number of cases that we used to see. We are doing about 500 uh, cases now. We to, it used to be much less than that. So we are obviously looking at other countries around us. Uh, we see that uh, it started in East Africa, in, in Kenya, Uganda, South Africa, and then began, and Congo then began to appear in West Africa, in uh, um, Ghana, uh, uh, Senegal, and now it's beginning to enter Liberia and, uh, and Gambia and so on. So all of us are seeing gradual increases. The 
Director General of the West African Health Organization, was with us this morning. Uh, we also confirmed that uh, it is entering the region. So you cannot give you the exact start date, and by the time you start doing sequencing, more genomic sequencing, to identify the exact uh, 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 sequence of the uh, virus, you will be uh, not very sure whether it's Delta, but you look, it looks as it's going to be, because the, the virus has been identified in at least 13 cases here. But we have not yet sequenced enough or received the results of enough sequencing to be quite sure that, yes, the Delta virus is responsible for all this increase. For example, somebody raised the question whether, OK, is this increase we are seeing not connected to some activities I had recently, some public activities around the uh, holidays, and uh, the, uh, there was a cleric that uh, was, uh, uh, had a uh, funeral for a cleric. Are they connected? These are all scientific ways of asking questions and seeing uh, how this one really connects. But evidence looks like it is the third wave because the regional, and then what we haven't got enough sequences yet to be 100% uh, uh, sure. But clinically, we are still OK. We are not seeing more and more people uh, losing their lives yet. We are not seeing more people getting more sick. Uh, their, their bed occupancy is not uh, skyrocketing. Uh, although in some areas there are more, more, more uh, admissions, in Lagos, for example, but on the average, it's not uh, uh, out, of, uh, out of our power. The health system is still very strong and still able to cope with what we are seeing. What we are doing here is to make sure we take more preventive measures. If we are able to prevent more people from being sick, if we are able to hold this virus at a particular level, then our health system will not be threatened. In that case, we will have, been, uh, will have uh, overcome the Delta variant uh, more easily than other countries. Because right now, it is not so much how strong your health system is, but how well your system can cope with the attack of the virus. And if you can cope well, you are fine. But generally, you continue to strengthen your health system. We are having more oxygen, about 70 or more oxygen plants coming up, improving uh, more ventilators. We are training more people. We are training people for intensive care. We are training people with surveillance in, uh, in sample collection. We are, we are looking at our strategies to improve everything so that we are more prepared. We also do a lot of uh, examination of, uh, I mean, uh, of uh, testing of um, visitors to uh, reduce importation. We are doing land border testing. We are doing testing even at sea seaports. We have found five cases among seafarers in the, in the Delta region. Uh, we have found even at the land border, we found at least three cases. So we are checking everywhere to reduce importation and also to reduce transmission so that the problems arising from all of these will be less for the health system. So that's the general approach we take. Is, um, the impact of the uh, um, increasing numbers of the Delta variant that we're finding and whether there's any impact uh, on the effectiveness of vaccines. Um, you know, when we talk about effectiveness of vaccines, we always have to think effectiveness against what? What are we trying to prevent? Uh, so the most important thing we're trying to prevent are severe illness and ultimately death. And as much as we uh, are dialoguing here about events in Nigeria, really, these issues are bothering everyone across the world. And what is going on now is a very effective coordination of research happening every day with sister national public health institutes across the world. And so far right now, there have been a few uh, studies that have shown that even with the Delta variant, the vaccine is very effective in preventing severe cases hospitalizations and deaths, right? Which is ultimately what we want to achieve. There's been some new data over the last week that transmission might still happen, even if you're vaccinated. But to, to be honest, it's a theoretical um, construct because yes, transmission could lead to more cases and ultimately more deaths, but in itself, um, in that individual patient, if you're vaccinated and you still get the infected, you will not, you're much, much less likely to have a severe illness. Um, so as much as we're very 
working very hard within the country uh, to prevent uh, cases. The key thing is to also do the diplomacy and the work the federal government is doing to get more vaccines into the country and to then make sure Nigerians take as much of the vaccine as possible. So the message is still, despite the Delta variant, please do get vaccinated. The vaccine prevents severe illness and prevents deaths in everyone that has been vaccinated. The, your second question was on sequencing in Lagos. So let me just try and be as precise as possible. Right now we found, as of this morning, 32 confirmed cases of the Delta variant in Nigeria, 32, right, from five states. Abuja, Oyo, Cross River, Lagos, and Akwaibom. Uh, some of these have been in returning travelers. Some have been local transmissions. Now, the biggest batch of uh, sequencing uh, that we got this morning was out of Akwaibom. So out of 23 cases there, 19 were the Delta variant. And that's why I said 80% of the cases in Akwaibom today uh, sequence. Sequencing is a very complex activity turned out to be Delta. So that is likely, uh, that is the most likely cause of the increased transmission we're seeing suddenly out of Akwaibom. Akwaibom was not one of the hotspots in the first and second waves, remember. We had FCT, Kaduna, uh, Lagos. So this is really a new state, so a lot of attention. So most likely, uh, somehow, someone returned to Akwaibom with a Delta strain, started transmission activities, and given the increased transmissibility of this, uh, variant, we're now seeing quite a number of cases uh, happening. So we're intensifying action in Akwaibom to contain it. Um, Lagos, yes, we haven't sequenced as many cases as we would like to. Uh, we have three uh, facilities in the public sector in Nigeria with sequencing capacity. And NIMA, uh, NCDC, and uh, the Africa Center for Excellence in Genomics in Edo. In addition, there are a few private sector players that now have that capacity, 54 gene, a private sector lab in Lagos. So we are working with Lagos to identify the most appropriate facility for them uh, to sequence their samples, and I'm sure that in the next few days, we'll really scale the uh, sequencing coming through out of Lagos so that we fully understand uh, what is happening in Lagos. Like the, uh, Chair, our chair said 50, right now, over 50% of all the positive cases in Nigeria are still reported out of Lagos State. At some point, it was even as high as 70%. So understanding what is happening in Lagos is critical to understanding what is happening uh, in the country. And your, your final question on, uh, or the, the final question on the third wave, you know, there's no scientific definition of when the third wave starts or stops. Uh, so, but we are seeing an increase in cases, and if you look at the epidemic curve, you see clearly an increase in cases in the last uh, few weeks. But remember, Nigeria is a big country, right? That we're having a third wave nationally, you need to look at the data at a slightly uh, more differentiated level. Like I just said, many of the cases uh, are being reported out of Lagos, Akwaibom, or your rivers. And many states, especially right now in northern Nigeria, are really not seeing a lot of cases. So it's still a very different picture across the different states in Nigeria. And that's our work, to continue to uh, do our surveillance and advise our colleagues on how to uh, respond. Thank you. Two Sir? The samples taken abroad. Do you have any information on any samples taken abroad? Uh, no. At the moment, to, to the best of my knowledge, no. Uh, we're not taking samples uh, outside of Nigeria for sequencing. There were earlier in the outbreak a few samples uh, done by universities in Nigeria in collaboration with their partner institutes. But like I said, right now we have three public sector institutions with sequencing capacity and one private sector institution. And our advice to every state in Nigeria is to use these public sector facilities for all the sequencing uh, work uh, we're, we're carrying out. And we're very grateful. Uh, the reagents, the equipment, the human resources required for sequence is very complex. This is not something you just uh, plug and play. So we're working to beef up those, that capacity and make sure that we are able to uh, deliver the information for our country. So right now we're not sending any samples outside of the country uh, for sequencing.
Yeah, thank you for those uh, brilliant questions. Uh, the first one is from uh, uh, Rachel. Uh, you asked about uh, you know, what types of assessments uh, would be done with the samples of the uh, vaccines. So what NAVDAP will be doing with these uh, sample, uh, sample, um, sampled vaccines uh, will be really to do some of the basic texts around uh, the appearance of the vaccine, uh, looking at the pH, the osmolality, like you say, these are things that you're very familiar with. Uh, they'll be doing some very basic tests. Most of the more complex uh, assessments have already been done, right? And I'm sure that you've heard in the past uh, during our media briefings that uh, what regulatory uh, authorities do is use what they call the reliance mechanism, right? When stringent regulatory uh, authorities such as uh, the FDA uh, and um, other regulatory uh, agencies have already done uh, some of the assessments, then NAVDAQ uses uh, the data that they have produced uh, to also take some decisions around uh, the quality, for example, of the clinical trials that have been done. And then when the uh, vaccines are brought, there are standard procedures that uh, NAVDAQ uh, does just to validate that all of the information uh, that is uh, provided for in the certificate of uh, analysis, for example, aligns with uh, what is expected uh, for uh, the uh, vaccine. This is exactly what was done with the Oxford AstraZeneca. So it's not any different uh, with what is being done with uh, the Moderna. And it is only, only when NAVDAQ is satisfied that the green light will be provided for us to now start rolling out the vaccines to the subnational uh, level. This is what happens for all uh, vaccines. Um, then there was a question about uh, the issue of uh, electricity and the challenges with maintaining the potency of the vaccine given the epileptic uh, electricity supply in Nigeria. So uh, it is not new to the Federal Ministry of Health and the National Primary Healthcare Development Agency, uh, the whole concept of uh, keeping vaccines at temperatures uh, that will keep them uh, potent. These are investments that the federal government and our partners have done in the last few years, especially uh, with the polio eradication program, right? So we've uh, been able to procure a lot of uh, cold chain equipment. But in terms of uh, ensuring that there's electricity all across the states, uh, the guidance has always been that uh, these cold stores where vaccines are kept, uh, these cold chain equipment where vaccines are kept, are usually hooked up uh, to what they call the blue line, like dedicated uh, lines that have constant electricity. But apart from that, what we've also uh, told the states to do, particularly because of the sensitive nature uh, of this vaccine, is that the ultra cold chain equipment will be linked up where there's constant uninterrupted power supply. Uh, if they are not satisfied with the uh, level of uh, electricity, the uh, constancy of electricity in their cold stores, uh, the backup generators that they have in their cold stores, they can also move this cold chain equipment to maybe the government house where maybe electricity is more constant. Uh, for some of the states, they've identified uh, tertiary hospitals where electricity is more constant and there's uh, regularity of uh, backup uh, power from generators that are fueled constantly. So uh, these engagements have been happening in the last uh, few weeks. So we are not concerned about uh, whether states will be able to maintain uh, these uh, temperatures. At the sub-national level, so the unique nature of the Moderna vaccine is, although it requires uh, ultra cold chain equipment uh, when it's being transported from um, the United States uh, to Nigeria and then storage at the national level, uh, it has the capacity to remain uh, potent uh, for up to 30 days within a temperature of plus two to plus eight degrees Celsius. So at the sub-national level, uh, the LGAs at the health facility level, uh, we're going to be deploying the vaccines there and the health workers are being trained uh, to know that they can only keep these vaccines for up to 30 days. So from our experience of the first phase, we know that they are able to finish up these vaccines uh, within a week and then they come back to the LGA level or the state level to get additional uh, vaccines. 
Uh, in terms of uh, the question from Vision FM was, uh, you know, he's of the opinion that uh, those who haven't taken the vaccines are those that do not want the vaccine. There's nothing that is further, to, further you know, from the truth. I mean, we came to Nigeria with just about uh, 4 million doses. That's a far cry from what we need, right? And we know that right after we finished the first phase of the vaccinations, you know, our phones were being, you know, blasted with calls about we need additional vaccines. We, here's the third wave coming. Where can we get uh, vaccines? We got a lot of calls from the state. So on the one hand, we acknowledge the presence of vaccine hesitancy. But anybody who has not taken the vaccine so far is not necessarily vaccine hesitant. The vaccine has just not uh, been available. Nevertheless, we're working with the Ministry of Information, uh, NOA, our partners, uh, NGOs, traditional and religious uh, institutions. We're using the same templates that helped us eradicate the wild polio virus uh, to really send out information out there. Uh, in the next few days, uh, the Honorable Minister of Health will be unveiling uh, a new strategy uh, that goes all the way to the world level, where we're going to be focusing on uh, really working with all of the partners at the world level, the LGA level, to make sure that the messaging goes straight uh, to the communities using community-based uh, 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 resource persons, right? Uh, the biggest challenge that we face right now with the vaccination is making sure that we get the correct information to Nigerians, especially in the face of misinformation and disinformation. And we believe that because Nigerians, for the most part, are rational, if you give them the correct information and they have these kinds of information coming from people that they trust, Nigerians will get over that hump of hesitancy. So on the one hand, yes, hesitancy exists, but we believe that we will overcome that just as we have overcome hesitancy that we saw um, during the polio eradication uh, drive. But we cannot do this alone. This is why we need the media to continue to point out and call out fake news, disinformation and inf misinformation about uh, the vaccines and provide the correct information about the vaccine. This is why we are partners. This is why we continue to look up to you to continue to do the outstanding work that you've already been doing uh, in the last uh, few months. Um, uh, uh, finally, in terms of uh, our uh, communication, uh, we recognize uh, that uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, this is why uh, we are very happy uh, to uh, get the uh, backing of uh, CACOVID uh, towards uh, providing support uh, for communication and social mobilization uh, activities. Uh, so thank you very much for those questions. Professor, Professor, Professor. Yes. Uh, vaccinated persons being asked to take vaccine in the UK. Uh, is there such a thing? No, I, have, I am not aware of that uh, information. No? Yes. Yeah, thank you very much, Richard, for that, that question. Uh, I, I like the fact that you do your, your research before you ask the questions, but it's also very important that you take the opportunity of this platform to get clarification. So the 12 hours, right, within which the vaccine should be used, right, is after the vaccine has been constituted, right? After you open the vaccine and you start using it, you, can, you have to use it within 12 hours. So no matter how remote uh, the health facility is, once, it is, once the vaccine is opened, it needs to be used up within 12 hours. Even if the health facility is here within uh, Abuja, you still need to use that vaccine within 12 hours. So for somebody who is in some distant uh, rural area in Taraba or Adamawa or wherever it is, the health worker is trained not to open the vaccines, right? Until they are sure that they have the numbers of clients to use. So if, for example, they are giving 100 vials of vaccines, right? They're not going to open up all those vaccines, right? They're going to wait knowing very well that 
those vaccines can be stored in regular refrigerators for 30 days, right? So no matter how remote it is, you have the window of 30 days to take it to that a remote setting and then bring it back when you're not uh, going to use them. Yes, thank you. Yes. Yes. No, it's not correct. I, I think you need to verify your, your information. Yeah. It, it doesn't make any sense. And I do not believe that uh, the UK government will put people's lives at risk. I think we should verify that, that information. Quarantine, that is, is their rule, and we have to go with uh, you know, that rule because those rules are provided even ahead of your travel to that uh, country, right? Just like people also uh, complain about maybe the rules that we have in Nigeria. We need to protect Nigerians just like uh, UK citizens need to be protected by their government, but they will not be given additional vaccines when they have proof that they've been already vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for that correction. Let's now um, invite uh, Mary Adechinuke Boyd, U.S. CDC Country Director, Nigeria. There was a question for me from our colleague here. Just to say this, this media team is amazing and will play an important role in um, helping to dispel those myths, uh, which we all know that is going to be very important to being able to or people in the U.S. have received at least one dose of the U.S. approved vaccines. Moderna is one of those. I'm one. I'm a Moderna recipient. <laughs> um, and it's important that we know that these vaccines are safe and they are effective. Now, an important part of rolling out any new vaccine um, is, is called adverse event monitoring. Now, what it does is pick up even exceedingly rare um, issues that come up in people that receive vaccines. And what the myocarditis and pericarditis, which you identified, is one of those. We've seen it in about less than 700 people, and uh, all of them have done well, okay, importantly. So um, the other important thing to note is while these things come up in people who have received vaccines, they don't they are not necessarily linked to the vaccine. That is the case with those two conditions. At this time, there is no clear evidence that links the myocarditis and pericarditis, which we see in viral illnesses of all kinds. Nothing at this point links them to the vaccine. Now, all that said, part of MPHCDA and Nigeria government's plan is to continue that adverse event monitoring, even as these uh, vaccines are being rolled out in Nigeria. So if anything comes up like that or any other issues come up, they will be picked up and they will be addressed. And this is, this is uh, what I just wanted to clarify. Thank you. Uh, the f complete, so the investigation doesn't get completed until even beyond approval. Does that make sense? So it w we, we, it'll be years before we say it's concluded. We will continue to look and look and look. But so far, there isn't any clear evidence of linkage between the vaccine and those uh, conditions. for closing remarks. Chairman, sir. Uh, Mitari, the, 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 the quarantine protocols for every country is different. What we have in Nigeria is different from what they have in the UK. Uh, so the demand, right now, if you are traveling from the United States and you are fully vaccinated into the UK, you don't need to be quarantined. They've given them that exemption. Uh, so uh, there are differences in terms of protocols. Uh, so I think uh, uh, probably what was conflicting in your mind was the fact that uh, after the vaccination, we are being asked to quarantine. If you come in from the UK into Nigeria, you will be demanded to quarantine for seven days. Isolate, not mandatory quarantine. To isolate for seven days until you go through the processes of the test, uh, the seven tests that would allow you to exit. 
NAVDA test. Uh, it's been adequately dealt with. But uh, let me emphasize the fact that NAVDAC has a responsibility to even test the batches of vaccines that come in. So far, we have had uh, about 4 million uh, Oxford AstraZeneca applied or uh, Nigerians have been vaccinated with that. The next batch that is coming, NAVDAC has a responsibility because it's a different batch from the one that has been used to test it before it is applied. So there are regulatory tests. There's nothing strange about it. They will go through that process. Once they are satisfied, we would uh, allow and, uh, 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 the vaccination process to start. Uh, samples taken abroad. OK, Chukwe has dealt with that effectively. Uh, Omar Liberty, you uh, did, uh, you did uh, allude to the fact that the Delta variant in, is in country and that uh, whether we are contemplating some measures, nothing is off the table. Let me be very categorical. Nothing is off the table when it comes to protecting the lives of the people of this country. We would not hesitate in taking measures that will be considered quite stringent. All the countries of the world are applying different measures. Countries that were adjudged to have successfully dealt with COVID-19 suddenly realized that they had to impose some certain measures to ensure that uh, they continue to balance lives and livelihood. And we will not hesitate. Like I said, nothing is off the table. We will continue to study the situation. We have always been guided by science and facts and the experiences of other jurisdictions before we take informed decisions. And we will continue to do that because it is very, very important that COVID-19, uh, the virus is novel. We will continue to understand the way uh, it operates, its mutation, its epidemiology, and all manners of things. Everybody is on a learning curve. Nobody has the full story. And until we get to a such a situation where we are comfortable about uh, uh, the variants in country, it's not only the Delta variant that is in country. There are other variants. Uh, Chikwe didn't address that, but probably at an appropriate moment he will talk about that. So we're dealing with different uh, variants and uh, uh, we will not hesitate to impose any kind of uh, uh, processes or protocols that will help protect the people of this country. So far, so good. We've tried as much as possible in spite of the weaknesses in our health infrastructure with the support of the friends of Nigeria, donor partners, and, uh, and, 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 and uh, uh, the resilience of uh, our people being able to get to where we are. Uh, uh, I believe uh, uh, we'll continue to do that. And like I said, nothing is off the table. When it comes to containing this virus, we will do everything to ensure that we contain the virus for the betterment of our people. Uh, tonight, I would uh, end by continually expressing our gratitude to the government and people of the United States for the generosity exhibited to our country. That's a mark of friendship, and we believe that uh, we will continue to receive this support, not only in terms of vaccines, but even in terms of even building capacity for our health institutions so that at least uh, if there are going to be any pandemic in the future, we will be better prepared uh, to deal with it. I want to thank you for this evening, and I'll continue to urge Nigerians that this is not the time to listen to conspiracy theories. I saw some clips of people uh, putting uh, spoons on their uh, uh, arms and uh, saying that because of the vaccines, uh, their bodies have become magnetic to metals. That's around nonsense. And we should not promote it. It just creates a situation of confusion in the minds of our people, something that is supposed to help them provide some extra backing of immunity and security for their lives. Uh, we just play around with it. 
and cause them to develop some elements of hesitancy towards the taking the vaccines. And like I said in my opening remarks, that unless we get done with this, uh, COVID-19 might be here for another decade if we don't deal with it. So it is better we deal with it most appropriately now so that we can begin to return to something that looks normal or else these coverings will be here with us as a people. So the choice is ours. In everything in life, you must assess the risk and take an informed decision to protect yourself, to protect your loved ones, to protect those that are around you. And that is what we will continue to do on the part of the Presidential Steering Committee, to give the guidance and the leadership that is required to deal with this virus. So far, we've tried, and I want to commend Nigerians for their support, but we need to do more as we approach the future. Thank you, and have a good evening. We want to thank the Chairman, the Honorable Ministers, and members of the President's Presidential Steering Committee, our partners, our donors, we we'll thank you very much for your patience in joining our program from the beginning till the very end. You'll get to hear from us, our viewer and listener back at home, when next we meet. Good night.